At this point, I have ridden a total of 20 different roller coasters in Florida. So I thought it made sense to do a top 20 ranking for the roller coasters I've ridden in there. I've ridden roller coasters at Busch Gardens Tampa, SeaWorld Orlando, Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, and Zoo Tampa. But I just want to say that Scorpion and Cobra's Curse were closed when I went, so you will not be seeing either of those on the list. But anyway, let's get right in the top 20. Starting out at number 20, we have Super Grover's Boxcar Derby at SeaWorld Orlando. And sometimes you get off a roller coaster and just wonder, what went wrong here when building it? And this is definitely one of them. It's rough and has bad profiling, and usually I would just kind of be like, okay, yeah, it's a kiddie coaster. But when you ride one like Air Grover that's the same model, and it's so much smoother, you just kind of start to wonder, like what happened i mean i don't hate it i just don't really like it so that's why it's at the bottom of this list at number 19 we have air grover at bush gardens tampa not much to say here just your average kitty coaster except unlike super grover's boxcar derby it's actually smooth so yeah not much else to say about it here at number 18 we have tasmanian tiger coaster at tampa zoo who even made this thing? Like it's so weird, but that's what makes it better than the other two that came before this. Like there's literally a straight drop in the beginning of the ride that's like banked 45 degrees or something. And the laterals are good on the helix. And I feel like the jankiness makes it more fun. At number 17 is Sand Serpent at Busch Gardens Tampa. Honestly, this is a very forgettable coaster. I literally forgot it even existed when I was at the park and almost missed the credit. But anyway, the hairpin turns are kind of uncomfortable but also fun at the same time, but then there are many brake runs later in the ride that really throw your stomach into the thin high resting lap bar, which can be pretty uncomfortable, but not as bad as that thing. For number 16 we have Goofy's Barnstormer at Magic Kingdom. I don't really have a good memory of this one because I wrote it about 7 years ago and I wasn't an enthusiast back then. But from what I do remember, it was pretty much just an above average kitty coaster with a good head chopper. Number 15 is Primeval Whirl at Animal Kingdom. Once again, it was about 7 years ago that I rode this one, so I didn't really remember much. But at least it doesn't have the uncomfortable brake runs like Sand Serpent. And it has a little double up after a biggest drop that's kind of fun, from what I remember. For number 14, we have Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Out of all the Disney coasters I rode, I probably remember the least about this one. But I remember it was like a more family-oriented version of Thunder Mountain. At number 13, we have Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I remember really liking this one. With the theming and good layout with good laterals, I think this is a good place to put on the list, from what I remember at least. For number 12 we have Journey to Atlantis at SeaWorld Orlando. Finally, one I did recently that wasn't at Disney. The Atlantis theming is really cool, and I went in blind so I had no idea what anything was going to be like, but probably the biggest surprise with a little dip after the first drop that completely soaks people in the front row. And I was in the front of the boat. But it did feel nice because it was around 90 degrees that day, so it was nice to cool off. And then the other part that surprised me was the coaster section. Not only did I not know when it was coming, but I only expected it to be a little 10 foot dip. And then I was just like gonna go into the splashdown. But I was wrong. The drop felt pretty steep, and I don't think the park posted a height for the drop, but it felt well over 100 feet, but I know it's not possible with the height of the actual ride itself. At number 11, we have our last Disney coaster, Expedition Everest at Animal Kingdom. You have a backwards helix, cool theming, and then a drop out of the mountain. I remember this one being crazy, 
but I was also a GP and very young. But at least it was smooth from what I remember. Okay, now I can finally only talk about ones that I have a fresh memory of. So at number 10 is Cheetah Hunt at Busch Gardens Tampa. A lot of people are probably surprised to see us rank so low, but here's the thing. I really wanted to like it more than I did. It's not that I didn't like it, it was just kind of like Sand Serpent, it was just kind of forgettable. But it is a pretty good family thrill coaster, and it does have a few good airtime moments. The first launch is fun, and the inversion gives great hang time. But I think my problem was I was expecting it to be one of the best roller coasters in the park. And I was thinking it would be this crazy extreme roller coaster. But it's not meant to be that. It's not meant to be anything more than a roller coaster for people on the younger side to get used to inversions and more thrilling elements. And it is a nice long ride. At number 9 we have Tigris at Busch Gardens Tampa. People really need to realize how good Skyrocket 2s are. It seems like people hate on them just because they're clones, but that doesn't change the ride experience at all. And also, Tigress's comfort cards don't bother me, but there will be some later on this list that do. But anyway, Tigress has some really good forces like weightlessness on the shuttle section, positive G's just about everywhere, hang time on the barrel roll, and a strong airtime moment into the highest point of the roller coaster. Number 8 is Kraken at SeaWorld Orlando. I've heard that this coaster has a really bad rattle, but I really didn't think it did. I mean, there were a few moments of headbanging, but not bad at all. And it isn't quite as intense as Kumaramontu, but it still has some really good gray out moments. For example, like the helix before the mid course and has a really good second half. I also got airtime on the drop. I heard that you can't even get it in the back and I was sitting in the middle. At number seven, we have Sheikah at Busch Gardens Tampa. The only other dive coaster I've ridden is Valraven. And I still prefer that one because it's a bit of a more complete ride with more inversions, but I do really like Sheikah. And there are some things about it that I like better, like the two drops because of the over the shoulder restraints. And the Immelman somehow manages to give airtime on the exit if you're sitting in the far right of the train. For number 6, we have Montu at Busch Gardens, Tampa. The Batwing is no joke. Montu literally tries to kill you, and you are pretty much graying out on almost every element. Like the two vertical loops feel like what I would imagine a short scoff loop would feel like. Like if you've seen Raptor's loop, it kind of stalls out the top and like, yeah, it's still very intense. But Montu decides it's just going to pull you right over the loop and try to kill you again. And then the trenches make you feel like you're going even faster than you actually are. But, of course, there are a few dead spots in the second half. So that's why I had to move it down a spot, too. Still a really good ride, just there had to be something to help me rank them. At number 5 we have Icebreaker at SeaWorld Orlando. Don't be fooled, this is no family coaster. I mean how can you be fooled with that 54 inch height requirement anyway? But anyway, I did my first ride in the back row and I got some pretty good airtime moments. But I still thought of it as just a family thrill coaster. But when I rode it for the second time, I rode it in the front. And that's when I realized this coaster has some real airtime. The final step up into the top hat has the strongest airtime moment in all of Orlando. And if it wasn't for Iron Guazi, all of Florida. Not to mention, I had three inches of room between me and the lap bar, so I could really feel that airtime. And I actually enjoyed the rollback off of the top hat more than the spike. It nearly feels like an inversion. And the airtime you get on the top hat, speaking of the top hat, and the rest of the ride, is also strong ejector. But there's one more thing about it that isn't good at all. The comfort collars, that are not comfortable at all. I don't know why, but these ones bother me way more than the ones on Tigris. They feel like they rest closer to your neck or something. So when I could have been putting my hands up, I was pulling the comfort collars away from me. But as long as I was doing that, they weren't that painful. 
I'm also on the shorter side, so I got more head banging instead of neck banging, so that could be why. Number four is Kumba at Busch Gardens Tampa. A lot of people are probably confused why I put this ahead of Montu. The reason is because besides the Batwing, Kumba is equally as intense, and also has a pretty good Cobra roll to make up for the no Batwing. Not to mention, there are no dead spots, and the second half is much better than Montu's already amazing second half. I really hope they don't remove Kumba anytime soon, but there have been rumors about it reaching the end of its service life. And I hope when it does, or if it does, they can spend all the money they have to to replace all of its track and let it operate for years to come. Especially when there are roller coasters like Corkscrew at Cedar Point that have to be way past their end of their service life and are very uncomfortable. No one likes them, no one rides them, but they're still there. For number three, we have Manta at SeaWorld Orlando. And wow, I did not expect to like it this much. It's so graceful and fun with its inversions and overbanks, and the second half has a cool water effect and some terrifying foot choppers. Like I literally couldn't even keep my eyes open during that part. And the pretzel loop is so intense how it just pins you down in your seat so hard. And the entire thing feels so unnatural compared to other roller coasters, but in such a good way. And in the POVs I saw before I rode it, it looked like it was going very slow and it was going to be boring at some parts, but I was completely wrong. Number two is Mako at SeaWorld Orlando. If I could use one word to describe this coaster, it would be airtime. There is so much airtime, mostly floater. But there is one ejector moment that I'll talk about in a little bit. I marathoned this coaster four times in a row. And I could have done it even longer, but I didn't want to run out of time for riding the other roller coasters. But for the layout itself, you have the best part, the five second floater hill, which is easily one of the best airtime moments overall out there. And then many other airtime hills, which are also really good. Then you have two twisted drop head chop drops, and then some fun graceful overbanks at the end. And then especially when you have two inches of airtime room like I did, it makes it even better. But I'm not done talking about the layout yet. Remember that ejector moment I was talking about? Well, it's really only if you're riding towards the back. And it's the first drop. I did not expect that level of airtime strength at all. I thought that since it was a B&M, going to be like graceful floater, and it was rare to get anything more than floater, no ejector or anything like that, but I was completely wrong, and I was very surprised. At number one, which should be no surprise to anyone at all, is Iron Gwazi. <sighs> I don't even know where to start with this one. This is easily the best coaster in the entire world that I've ridden at least. But the only other roller coasters I could even see having a chance at beating Iron Gwazi are maybe Ride to Happiness or Zadra, but even those don't look like they're as good. So pretty much what I'm saying is no matter how many roller coasters I ride, I don't think my number one will change unless something that's new gets built and is like better. Maybe the Busch Gardens Williamsburg 2024 project if it ends up being an RMC. But like, besides that, I really can't think of anything that could possibly be better than this. I mean, at the same time, people never thought that they'd top Steel Vengeance, but that doesn't really matter right now. So let's talk about the ride itself. The drop is completely insane in the back row, and I swear you can feel the extra degree from Steel Vengeance's 90 degrees. And then there's the wave turn. Don't even get me started on the wave turn. Sustain ejector throughout the entire thing. And the outer bank gave real ejector unlike the one on Steel Vengeance. The ending finale just also completely beats Steel Vengeance in any way possible. The airtime is stronger and more sustained. The strongest airtime moment on Iron Gwazi is the second bunny hill before it leads into the last big drop. And to be honest, 
I think that might be the strongest airtime moment I've ever experienced on any roller coaster. Like, Steel Engines is a very long ride and still my number two roller coaster, but Iron Gwazi is more about the quality over quantity. And at the end of the day, I think quality just matters more than quantity. Like, I hear people complaining about how Iron Gwazi is so much shorter than Steel Vengeance, and that's why Steel Vengeance is better, and that's the only reason. But if this thing was any longer, you would literally die. And, like, literally in the morning, I already knew it was my number one after the first ride. And, wow, did it speed up throughout the rest of the day. At the end of the day, it was just completely flying. So I got two super fast Iron Gwazi sunset rides, which have to be the best coaster experience I've ever had in my entire life, especially the back row ride. I can't even put it into words how much I love this roller coaster. I could talk about it all day, but I'm sure you guys don't want to listen to me talking about Iron Gwazi all day. So I'm going to end the video here. But first, I want to say, overall, I had a really amazing trip in Florida. And Iron Gwazi was definitely one of the highlights of the trip. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe for more. And I will see you in the next video.